Hello, everyone. I'm Robbie Sproul from uh, Utah State University. I'll be the moderator today for this discussion. Um, I work in the teaching and learning department and I research cool new technology. Um, so now I'm just going to turn the time over to JC to introduce herself and uh, get the ball rolling. Awesome. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is JC Hacker and my pronouns are she, her and hers. Um, I'm the honors director here at Southern Utah University. And first, I just want to thank you for showing up um, at 2.40 in the afternoon when all of us like to um, crash after our lunch. And um, so, so thanks for showing up. And I hope that um, we can stay focused and our attention can be here. Uh, if you need to get up and walk around, that's awesome. Please do so. If you can turn your cameras on, I love to see your faces. And if not, then that's perfectly fine too. Um, so today I'm going to be sharing my experience of um, involving my honor students in the evaluation of online discussion tools. And before we begin, just a little bit about me and this research. So I am currently a doctoral student at the in the Mary Lou Fulton Teachers College at Arizona State University. And so I'm deep into the throes of my dissertation work, and this is a small piece of it. Um, so this, this research has spanned several years coming together, and I'm distilling this down into a 20 minute present presentation. So hopefully it makes some sense, and I haven't left out in really important elements there. So feel free to let me know if you have questions, but know that this is um, just a tiny piece of a bigger puzzle. Um, let's see, so this research took place, just some context, um, last semester, so fall of 2020 in an online honors asynchronous seminar course that I was teaching with 10 of my honors students. Um, so today, these are the things that we'll cover. Uh, hopefully, I think we'll get to all of them and have plenty of time for, for discussion at the end, but we'll start with an overview of honors education for those that may not be familiar with that. Talk about online learning and the way it's changing the landscape of higher education and education kind of in general. Um, and then I'll talk about some of the theoretical perspectives and frameworks that I used for this research and how they informed the actual experience in the classroom with the students. Um, and again, we'll have time at the end for some questions and discussion. So honors education is um, available at most higher education or across the country. So we have honors programs and colleges in most institutions. And one of the things that we really hold dear is this idea of face-to-face -face learning being the primary mode of instruction. And for some in the honors community, that mode of learning is um, really the gold standard and the only standard. Um, up until COVID entered our world, uh, the discussion regarding online education in an honors program uh, was very taboo. Uh, no one was having those conversations and people who did engage in those conversations were kind of the black sheep of the honors family. However, here at Southern Utah University, um, a big focus has been placed on expanding our online degree programs. And I'm sure this is similar with a lot of institutions as we recognize the need to diversify the way that we offer courses to our students who are increasingly more diverse. And online learning is one way in which we can do that. So here at SUU, before the pandemic, so I think it was um, the spring of 2018, our institution partnered with an online program management company to expand um, all of our online program offerings and to double practically the number of online students that we had. So there was a very clear message from our uh, leadership, our administration, the online learning and online programs were an essential element of the future of our um, educational offerings for our students. And so part of who I am as, um, as an educator, as a leader is um, I want to always be sure that what I'm doing reaches the biggest group of students possible and that anyone who's interested in being an honor student and wants to have that experience as they earn their degree has the opportunity to do so. 
Um, I was a non-trad student and um, completed my degree in a lot of a lot of weird ways. And so I understand how important it is to have flexibility and accessibility to lots of programs. And so online learning was something I was really interested in for our honors program here at SUU. So I started my uh, doctoral work with that being my focus of how do we um, kind of address this lovely conflict between honors education and um, online education, two seemingly disparate philosophies about the best way to teach and to have high quality um, outcomes with our students. Uh, and I knew that there had to be a way because one of the other great ethics of honors is that we are going to try something and keep trying until we figure out how to make it work. And so that, that was my, my goal here was to design an online honors seminar course that could be offered asynchronously that resulted in similar, not the same, but similar outcomes as a student would have in a face-to-face -face course. Now, then of course the pandemic hit last spring and everyone in the world had to transition to online learning even those um, curmudgeons in the honors world. So my, 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 this conflict suddenly became reality for everyone. And so I had to kind of shift the, the focus of my research. And at that point in time, I was learning a lot about critical pedagogy um, and critical digital pedagogy and the importance of including students in the direction of their learning and giving them voice in um, the ways in which we design those experiences for them. So, so that led me to thinking that there was a great opportunity with this research to include the students in a way that I hadn't thought about before. And so I explored some different um, frameworks. And the one that I really, really landed on um, as being a good fit for honors is the community of inquiry framework. And some of you might be familiar with this. This was developed in 2000 by Garrison, Anderson, and Archer. Uh, what they did is they took um, transcripts of online discussion boards, and these were text-based transcripts, and they employed the, the use of a bunch of graduate students, and they went through and coded all of these transcripts, thousands of pages of discussions that were happening online, looking for common themes. So this is, you know, where kind of grounded theory comes in, where they were trying to figure out what's happening in an online discussion. And based on what they were seeing happening in the discussion, was there, um, were there better outcomes based on the evidence they were seeing in those discussions? And a result of that was this framework where they identified three presences that um, really inform the creation of a community of inquiry. And a community of inquiry is kind of their gold standard of um, a learning experience that takes students into critical thinking, collaboration, um, community building, and gives them a really high quality experience in an online asynchronous um, course. And again, this was all text-based um, because in 2000, we didn't have the video tools that we have now available to us. So the three presences they identified are social presence, cognitive presence, and teaching presence. And you can see the definitions here. Um, and, but for the purposes of this research, the two that were most important to me um, were social presence and cognitive presence. Um, because I wanted to see that the students were having that interaction with each other and that they were um, being challenged in those interactions, um, similar ways that they would be if they were face to face. And connected to this um, was, it, so this is all coming together in the summer of 2020, where the, the world is kind of uh, falling apart, right? And everyone around us is feeling this, this lack of control and that there's just so much happening and we feel completely helpless. And we were at the mercy of so many decision makers on so many different levels um, and had no say in those conversations. And this was one way for me to help kind of address that with my students by using participatory action research. And what this does is it 
elevates the students in the experience to the level of um, kind of co-researchers where they're having a very big say in the design and the implementation of the research. And so a lot of control was given to them at this point. So we have this class that we're going to be in together fall of 2020 that's going to be online asynchronous hoping to achieve similar outcomes as what we see in a face-to-face -face honor seminar course. And the question was, how can these students help me create that kind of experience for themselves in that class, but also for our future students? Um, and now keep in mind too, I'm working with honor students and there are reasons some of those stereotypes exist for honor students. Uh, they're very high achieving. They are generally pretty good with being guinea pigs. Um, they like experimenting and um, trying new things and they love having a voice in um, decision-making processes. So, so I had a great group of students to work with here. Um, this may not work in different student populations, but I had that privilege of um, these exceptional students. So I, I wanna pause here real quick before I dive into what we actually did to make sure we're all, because again, dissertation work is gigantic. I'm trying to distill it down. So I wanna make sure this is making sense and please stop me if it's not. So we have a conflict between honors education and online learning. Um, of course, everyone's experiencing that now because they're having to do it. Uh, so to kind of tweak that a little bit, um, we are involving participatory action research to have students voice included in that work. Um, we know the online learning is an essential part of the future of higher education. There's no way around that. Um, and honors needs to be part of that conversation. Um, Honors courses that are offered online need to have similar outcomes as our face-to-face -face courses. That has to happen, or we are not offering a, a equivalent experience for those um, distance learners who engage in our online courses. The Community of Inquiry Framework is a great tool for us to use. It's a validated tool um, that uh, many, many researchers use when we're looking at online communities of inquiry. And so that was an essential piece of all of this, is being able to have an instrument that can really help us evaluate different components of the course to see if they are reaching our expectations of what an honors course should be. Um, and then using participatory action research allowed the students in the course to kind of drive the bus in some regards for all of this coming together. So does that make sense? Okay, great. So the Community of Inquiry Survey is associated with the Community of Inquiry Framework um, that was developed again in 2000. And this is a 34 item Likert scale survey that measures the student perceptions of those presences in an online course. So we're talking about the social presence, cognitive presence and teaching presence. So generally this survey is given at the end of a course for students to evaluate um, to what degree they feel the course achieved that outcome. And these are some examples of statements on that Likert survey. Um, so, and, and they're, they're similar types of things that we would use to evaluate um, other courses, right? So it's a Likert scale, one to five, five strongly agree, um, one totally disagree, and 34 items. So it's pretty robust and it covers all three of those presences. Now the terminology used in that, that survey um, is antiquated, so it's old. And so we had to really dive into fixing that. So the student's first job was to fix the survey so it met their expectations and what they understood we were evaluating. So this is kind of a mess, but this is the process we engaged in for them to help me develop a tool that could be useful to evaluate the course. Um, the first step was the question as it is on the survey. So you can see step number one here. So this was the first original form question. The first thing students did is they went question by question and gave me feedback on that question. So 
up here for number two, you can see some of that feedback they provided. And based on that, three, that feedback, I then rewrote the question with a proposed revision. So just a few changes here. And then I gave that student those questions back to the students. And in the fourth step, they then commented if they thought that was a good change, if they wanted additional changes, if it made sense to them. And then we ended up with the final question that we all agreed on. So we did this with all items included in that survey. When the final survey was finished, we revised 17 of the questions. 16 stayed the same. They didn't see any reason to change them. And one question we eliminated altogether. They just felt it was completely redundant and useless for it. Um, and then I utilized Google Forms to um, implement the survey throughout the course. And I'm going to just check time. I need to be done by three, right? Is that right, Robbie? Okay, so I'm going to go fast. I got excited. Um, so we use three discussion tools throughout the course. Now remember, this is all asynchronous for our students. So the students selected the discussion tools, and this is in line with the participatory action research and utilizing critical digital pedagogy to make sure we're using the tools that they felt comfortable using and that they wanted to evaluate to see how they worked in an online course. So we settled on Flipgrid, the Canvas discussion board, and then Zoom. And of course, Zoom is not asynchronous, so that throws a wrench into this, but it's their voice and they have control. Um, the final survey we used to evaluate each of those discussion tools, I pulled them from the revised survey and the ones that were applicable to the discussion. So that ended up being nine questions the students used to evaluate each tool. Um, they also wanted an open-ended option so they could rate the um, user responses there, use Likert scale, but also give me some more context for their answer. Mm -hmm. So they can give me some different feedback, like this was a terrible idea, we should never have done that, um, and this is why. So that was another thing we added to the survey based on student feedback. Um, I only had 10 students in the class, so uh, the quantitative data we collected is not very useful. But here you can see that based on the number of students who completed the evaluations on each of the tools, um, there's not a significant difference between any of them based on just the Likert skills. But when we look at the qualitative data, so I've been coding those open-ended responses for each discussion tool to see what they were thinking um, and how they ranked them the way that they did. There are some pros and cons to each of the tools. Um, but overall, the students reported using Zoom, um, they like that one the best. And, and that makes all the sense in the world to me because it's in real time, they can see each other's reactions, body language, it's a conversation. Um, so that one, uh, but it's very different than the Canvas discussion board and Flipgrid because those are more um, static places to engage in that discussion. Um, you can see some of the things that they said about each of those tools here. The thing that really stood out to me the most, I think, about this, and I'll, I'll kind of end here, is that participatory action research involving the students in evaluating each of these discussion tools in the course was an incredibly valuable experience. First, for the students, because they felt seen, they felt like they had some control over the outcomes of the course, they took the course more seriously because they knew what they were doing in the course was going to inform the future iterations of, those, of that course. Um, and this is coming from some of their final course reflections that they had almost a sense of anxiety as they were filling out these evaluations because they didn't want to mess up. They wanted to make sure the information they were giving me is the best information possible. Now, some limitations here are that since they selected the discussion tools, um, there's a chance they ranked them higher than they would have normally if I had selected them. So they, that sense of ownership kind of goes both ways. They may have been more generous with those evaluations. Um, but overall, I think, and the other takeaway here is having the students design the evaluation tool with me helped them understand exactly what we were evaluating. 
So when they were using those that Likert skill, I have full confidence they know exactly what we were looking at. Um, and we were all on the same page about what the evaluation was for. And they understood the terms of that. I think often when we give course evaluations, students um, may not have a full understanding of what we're asking. And by engaging them in creating the assessment at the beginning of the course, um, those responses are a lot more meaningful to me as an instructor and also for the students because they feel confident that the information they're giving me is the most applicable it can be. Um, I have no time for questions, but does anyone have any? There, there is one in the chat. Um, how often do you give the COI survey to students? So we, so I've only done this for one semester in one class. We had three different discussion tools. So they used the COI survey that we created together um, after the implementation of each discussion tool. So we used um, Flipgrid for three weeks and then they evaluated it. Then we used Canvas for three weeks, they evaluated it, and then we did Zoom for three weeks and then they evaluated it. And then they used the entire COI survey to evaluate the course as a whole at the end of the semester. So four iterations of that survey. There's my references. Out of time, but there is one more question. Does the nature of honor students content type of discussion results in your opinion? Oh, can you say that again, Robbie? I kind of lost you. Sure. Does the nature of an honor student and the type of content and discussion impact the results in your opinion? Yes, absolutely. Non-honor students. Yeah, um, and I think that that's an important thing to keep in mind is that our students are very invested in their education. And I know that that's true for a lot of students, but if you were doing in this in a general education class, um, there would be some pretty um, different kind of limitations there. But there is value in engaging students in how we evaluate courses, um, their opinions in what they feel is most important and having them, giving them a voice in that, I think would be meaningful to all students regardless of um, whether or not they're honor students. Great, and this would be the last, um, some people would like to get a hold of your version of the survey. Yeah, let me, um, let me think here. I'll just put my email address into the chat. And feel free to email me and I can send you um, what we came up with. I'll send you the original version too, because I think it's important to see the differences there. The, the community of inquiry has an online community course. Um, so lots of research articles are available there. Um, and if you have time, it's, it's, a, it's a really valuable resource. You can dive pretty deep into the, the theory behind it and the way that it's being used um, in lots of different um, pockets of education. Great. Thanks so much, JC. Welcome. Thank you. Link to provide feedback in the chat. You guys want to fill that out? And um, thanks so much for attending and everyone have a great day.